Based on our earlier discussion of the quantum mechanical selection rules, we can come to the conclusion that there are some excited states that are just impossible to reach via what we call direct excitation or absorption of a photon from the ground state. A good example of this is the T1 state of many structures, alkenes in particular, where the S1-T1 energy gap is very large. That said, we're often very interested in the reactivity or the properties of the triplet states of alkenes and other inaccessible excited states, and so this raises the question of is there a way to access these excited states without direct excitation? The answer is yes, and the way we do it is the subject of this video. It's called sensitization, and you'll often see this abbreviated as SINs in reaction schemes. Sensitization takes advantage of energy transfer, which is why we're talking about it now, and it uses a molecule that's already in an excited state, typically with a multiplicity that matches the multiplicity of where we want to go. So here, for example, a triplet molecule R star. We combine that with the ground state of our molecule of interest, and an energy transfer process takes place here to generate the T1 state of our molecule of interest. This is called triplet sensitization, and it's a very common route to the generation of triplet states that can't be made through excitation followed by inter-system crossing. In this video, we'll define some terms related to sensitization and talk about the ideal features of a sensitizer, which includes some concerns about thermodynamics, the absorption properties of the sensitizer relative to our molecule of interest, and a few other things. Previously, we identified in this general picture of energy transfer the energy donor, D star, and the energy acceptor, A, which is typically in its ground state. There's another way we can think about the energy donor and energy acceptor in the language of sensitization. We can think about the donor as a sensitizer in the sense that it sensitizes A to form A star. From the other perspective, thinking about what A does to D star, we can think of A as a quencher. A quenches the other processes that D star might do, for example, fluorescence or phosphorescence, instead leading to radiationless deactivation to the ground state of D and formation of, of A star. So from D star's perspective, A is a quencher, and from A's perspective, D is a sensitizer. And it's worth noting that these terms are essentially synonymous with energy donor, the energy donor is always a sensitizer, and energy acceptor, the energy acceptor is always a quencher. It sometimes takes some thought when you're wading through the literature of photochemistry to sort out these definitions, because you'll see sensitization and quenching talked about in a certain sector of the literature, and energy donors and acceptors talked about in another sector, and it's really the same underlying energy transfer process that's going on here. We just give different names to the donor and acceptor. Of course, as in all chemical processes, conservation of energy must be obeyed in a sensitization process. What this means in practice is that the excitation energy of the energy donor needs to be higher than the excitation energy of the acceptor. Now again, endothermic energy transfer is not impossible, it's just kinetically very slow. And so if an endothermic energy transfer process has negative delta G, still has the, the capability of taking place thermodynamically, generally speaking, it's going to be so slow as to not be useful. So this is the first key criterion for sensitization. It has to obey conservation of energy. A second key criterion is that the emission spectrum of the donor and the absorption spectrum of the acceptor must overlap. If we plot the emission and absorption spectra on the same graph with wave numbers on the x-axis and some normalized intensity measure on the y-axis, there has to be this region here where the two spectra overlap. The basic reason for this is that D and A must have accessible states at a common energy value in order for the energy transfer process to take place. These common energy states provide a mechanism for non-radiative energy transfer. And without those common energy states, there will be no mechanism for energy transfer, and it will be essentially impossible or kinetically very, very slow. This table charts the properties of a wide variety of sensitizers, and I won't go through the table in detail. I'll just make a few general remarks here. So, some things we're interested in concerning a sensitizer. The energy of the singlet and triplet states. Exothermic energy transfer, of course, if, if we want energy transfer to be exothermic, which is very common, we need to choose a sensitizer whose singlet or triplet energy is higher than the singlet or triplet energy of the compound that we're trying to 
excite essentially through the energy transfer process. The lifetime of the sensitizer is also of interest because it has to hang around long enough to transfer its energy to our molecule of interest. If it decays too quickly back to the ground state or it fluoresces or phosphoresces, then we won't get the energy transfer process that we want. This phi st is the quantum yield of intersystem crossing, and if we're interested in triplet sensitization, it is important that this number be high. The reason is we want all of the singlets to convert to triplets, and so you can see molecules like acetone, xanthone, a, a number of simple ketones convert to the triplet state with great efficiency, and that's great for a triplet sensitizer since the vast majority of molecules then in the excited state are in the triplet state. So to sum up, if we're trying to achieve triplet sensitization, the conversion of a ground state molecule of interest to its first excited triplet state, we need five key features. The first is high triplet energy, so that the energy transfer process is exothermic. The triplet energy of the sensitizer must be higher than the triplet energy of the excited state we're trying to generate. Short singlet lifetime is key. This is, this again plays into inner system crossing. We do not want the singlet to be hanging around because singlet singlet energy transfer is a process that can take place, provided the thermodynamics make sense. And if that's undesirable, as it is in the case of triplet sensitization, we want the singlet to have a very short lifetime. And you can see that borne out actually in this table that the singlet lifetimes are all 10 to the negative seven seconds or below, which is great for ensuring triplet energy transfer. Conversely, the flip side is we want long triplet lifetime so that the triplet, again, hangs around without phosphorescing or undergoing radiationless deactivation itself before it can transfer its energy to our molecule of interest. We at least need the triplet to hang around long enough to engage in diffusional collisions with our molecule of interest at the concentrations we're trying to use. High quantum yield for inner system crossing. We need this to ensure, again, that the triplet is the dominant excited state and solution of our sensitizer. And then lastly, we want the triplet sensitizer to have minimal absorption overlap with the acceptor. And this is important to talk through. Let's look at the words very quick, carefully here. We want minimal absorption overlap with the acceptor. The reason for this is we do not want to photo excite the acceptor while we're photo exciting the sensitizer. In essence, we want the acceptor to have no absorption under the conditions of sensitization. Because if the acceptor absorbs, it will do so into its singlet state. And then we've achieved the undesirable result of generating the singlet state of our acceptor molecule instead of its triplet state, which is the goal of triplet sensitization. So in an ideal world, if we look at the two absorption spectra, so absorbance on the y-axis and say wave number on the x-axis, the sensitizer will have an absorption peak that looks something like this, typically at relatively high energy, since the sensitizer's triplet energy must be higher than the acceptor's triplet energy. And the acceptor's absorption spectrum will be very far removed from the sensitizers, maybe something like this, so that the region of overlap between the acceptor and sensitizer is, is very small or essentially negligible in an ideal world. Experimentally, what we do is we use a light source combined with filters to ensure that we've got a high concentration of photons at this wave number to photo excite the sensitizer, but then we use a filter to cut off the light below a certain energy value. For example, if our situation is like this with the sensitizer's singlet energy higher than the acceptor's singlet energy. This ensures that the acceptor is not photo excited because there are no photons at this relatively low energy impinging on our system. Only the sensitizer is photo excited and through a non-radiative energy transfer process it transfers its excitation energy to the acceptor. That's sensitization in a nutshell. And it's key that there is minimal absorption overlap, ideally none at all, a negligible amount, between the acceptor and sensitizer. In many cases, we're interested in actually quenching an excited state. And this is the other side of the coin with sensitization. Again, it's the same fundamental process, but now we are interested in actually turning off an excited state. This is commonly used in experiments where if we want to provide evidence that a particular excited state is involved in a reaction, if we quench that excited state and the reaction turns off, that's pretty good evidence that the excited state is involved in that reaction. And so, 
What's the ideal for the, a triplet quincher? Well, now we're on the other side of the coin, right? Now we have an excited state R star, and we want to rapidly and efficiently convert R star back to the ground state, let's call it R, through an energy transfer process in which the quincher becomes photoexcited. And very often, the quincher, through some kind of non-radiative process that's pretty innocuous, will return to its ground state. If we want this process to rapidly deactivate R, we need a few things out of the triplet quencher Q. First, we need low triplet energy so that this energy transfer process is exothermic, the flip side of the sensitizer, right? We want high sensitizer energy, low quencher energy. We want a short triplet lifetime for the quencher. And the idea here is that we want the quencher to rapidly return to its ground state this avoids any shenanigans associated with photochemical reactivity or absorption properties, phosphorescence, etc., associated with the quencher's excited state. And as in the case of sensitization, we still need minimal absorption overlap with the donor because we need the quencher to be in its ground state in order to generate Q star. Say Q star is a triplet, right? Say we're interested in triplet quenching. R star is, say, a T1 state. That's going to put Q star in a T1 state after the energy transfer process, and we do not want to photo excite the quencher, right? Because that would generate the S1 state or some singlet state from the ground state of the quencher. We want the only excitation of the quencher to come from energy transfer from R star. And the key experimental criterion or empirical criterion that we need to obey there is minimal absorption overlap with the donor. So this table just surveys some of the singlet and triplet energies of quenchers with this idea in mind that for an ideal quencher, we need low energy of the corresponding excited state so that the overall energy transfer process is exothermic. And I'll just draw your attention to a class of compounds that's very commonly used as triplet quenchers, these alkenes with relatively low triplet energies. So these are very efficiently generated through energy transfer, and they cannot be made through singlet excitation followed by intersystem crossing. So cis-stilbene, for example, is one. Trans-stilbene is another. Cyclohexadiene. These are all conjugated alkenes that have very low triplet energies and are great triplet quenchers. Even the simple alkene 2-butene can be great for this purpose, provided the triplet energy R star here is greater than 78 kilocalories per mole. All of these alkenes have available a very rapid process that converts their triplet state back to the ground state involving cis-trans isomerization, which is a very common process of these alkenes, as we'll see later in the course. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the granddaddy of all triplet quenchers, oxygen. Huge problem for conducting photochemical reactions in the atmosphere is the quenching of triplets by oxygen, which is itself a triplet. In fact, the ground state of oxygen is a triplet. 23 kilocalories per mole is its triplet energy, and so almost any triplet state is going to be able to transfer its energy to oxygen. And oxygen is, is very commonly used as a diagnostic molecule for the presence of a triplet state or reactivity of a triplet state. Again, if oxygen turns off a photochemical reaction, that's great evidence that the reaction is occurring through a triplet state.